uh, welcome every welcome everyone um, this is um, an online meeting that we organized from the uno neuropsychiatry ecmp network uh, regarding the theme um, you know, psychiatry. and um, it has been a time where it's not very easy to physically meet uh, we're getting used to online meetings and we're really happy that more than 180 people registered for this online meeting. So what we want to do today with you is spend some time on where are we in the field of immunopsychiatry? What do we know and what do we not know? And the morning session will be completely organized around that theme. We will hear uh, combined talks regarding three uh, basic themes looking at mechanistic research, observational research, and intervention research in the field of immunopsychiatry. I'm Brenda Penix. I'm professor of psychiatry at uh, Amsterdam UMC, uh, uh, connected to the Vrije University in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And I will be sharing this morning session. Um, but before we get started with talks, I want to briefly give the word to Marion Le Boyer, who is actually the chair of our ECMP network. Marion? Thank you very much, Brenda. I just want to welcome you all and say how happy I am to see so many people attending. So as just as Brenda said uh, a minute ago, I'm the chair of the ECNP network on immunopsychiatry, uh, along with Michael Benrose, who is my vice president, and Livia de Piquet, who is uh, general secretary. Uh, my name is Marion Le Boyer. I'm professor of psychiatry in University of, of Paris. And I'm probably, as you know, passionate about immunopsychiatry, so very happy to see so many of you uh, attending this uh, meeting. Uh, before we start, I want to express my thanks to Brenda Penix to have accepted to host this meeting. We wanted to have it uh, in Amsterdam, will probably be for the next time if COVID allows us. Uh, and uh, I thank her very much to have built the project, the program, and, and to be chairing this meeting. And I also want to address my very sincere thanks to Olivia de Piquet, who has been an, a remarkable organizer uh, of, this, of this meeting. Uh, and uh, she, she really has done a, an amazing job. So I wish you a very pleasant and interesting meeting. And without ado, I give the floor to maybe the first spe speech. Uh, yes. Or you want to do that, Brenda? Yeah, so we, the first um, presentation is a dual presentation and that will be given by Igor Branchi and uh, Lucille Capuron. I know that they will introduce uh, themselves further. I would like to ask everybody to please um, mute yourself during the talks and uh, wait with the questions till after the talk. There are There is probably a room for some short questions right after their talk, but we also do have a general discussion at the end of the morning session where the more general questions can be um, asked as well. So please write down your questions. We can use uh, the chat for that so that we can see what questions come in, but it, it is possible that we will answer some of the questions in the general discussion. Um, and with that, I would like to now um, give the word to Igor and, and Lucille, who are gonna talk about mechanistic research in immunopsychiatry. Igor and Lucille, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Brenda. <clears throat> For, uh, for uh, the introduction. I'm uh, Igor Branchi and I'm uh, a researcher and group leader at the Italian Institute of Health in, in Rome. Okay, uh, the, the, first, the first session of the morning is about mechanistic research in, in monopsychiatry. And I, I will start saying, uh, providing some historic roots about, about this discipline, in particular, uh, the, the first attempts to uh, identify a link between the brain and immune system was uh, in the uh, second half of the last century uh, in the discipline with the discipline of second year immunology. And uh, for instance, in the 70s, the first link between the brain and immune system was identified. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> Um, learning uh, activities was, was found to alter uh, immune, immune markers in the periphery. And also uh, the link uh, in the other direction was identified immediately after and an important contribution was given by Robert Gatzer. 
and uh, uh, they showed, uh, they and other authors show that uh, uh, by injecting uh, uh, pro inflammatory cytokines in the periphery, there is an alteration in brain function and in the overall outcome. So, a clear uh, link between brain and immune st system was established. And uh, this this uh, this clear connection led to the to the to the to, the, uh, to a new uh, this discipline that is the immunopsychiatry that is aimed at linking immune dysregulation with psychiatric disorders. In the last uh, decades, uh, immunopsychiatry provided a very important contribution to the fields of neuroscience and psychiatry, and uh, uh, the number of papers uh, on, on on this topic is. Uh, Deadly and uh, uh, and constantly increasing uh, uh, during the last uh, the last ten years. However, uh, finding uh, uh, identifying the mechanism linking the immune dysregulation with uh, uh, psychiatric psych disorders and in particular major depression, major depression is my research field, is not is not easy to 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 do uh, to achieve uh, and. There is an important debate in the literature about, about these difficulties, but probably one of the uh, one of the main conceptual causes uh, um, for this difficulty is the unclear causal relationship between uh, the immune dysregulation and uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, in particular major depression. Uh, there are two specific issues. The first one is the egg and chicken. And this means that uh, it's not clear what comes first. There are studies showing that uh, uh, first comes depression that leads to an increased uh, inflammatory markers, but also the opposite has been, has been clearly demonstrated. And the second uh, important issue in this unclear uh, causal relationship is that uh, mm, immune dysregulation is neither sufficient nor necessary to uh, um, produce uh, uh, depression. So uh, probably to, to, to help on this matter, we might use a conceptual tool that is the distinction between two types of uh, causality. Uh, the first type is an instructive causality, which is what we consider causality when we talk about that. It's a standard uh, uh, relationship between an event that produces an outcome, it rains and then the floor is wet, something very simple, but there is also another type of uh, uh, causality that is very common, but less considered, that is permissive causality. And in this case, the event has nothing to do directly with the outcome, but what this event does is to decrease or increase the likelihood of another event to produce an outcome. And this is probably the kind of causality that we have in this, in this uh, relationship between immune dysregulation and depression. And this justifies why uh, just uh, a percentage, a high percentage, it's a 30 to 40 percent of uh, depressed patients, but anyway, it's just a percentage shows high level of uh, inflammatory markers. The mechanism uh, linking uh, immune dysregulation with major depression are, uh, have been uh, highly investigated and um, many have been proposed. Recently, uh, on behalf of the Immune Neuropsychiatry Network, we published this review paper and uh, we described uh, some of these. And uh, I will describe uh, uh, very shortly uh, some, of, um, some of this because uh, this will be described also by uh, the following speakers. The first one, <clears throat> the first uh, mechanism linking uh, the immune dysregulation with major depression is uh, uh, the kinorinine pathway. And this concerns uh, the processing of uh, the tryptophan that can be processed on one pathway to produce serotonin that we know we all know it's an important uh, neurotransmitter deeply involved in depression, or otherwise tryptophan can be processed uh, by uh, either and TDO to produce kinorinine that in turn produce kinorinic acids that has a neurotoxic effect that probably is linked to depression. And what has been shown is that the immune system activation increase uh, the likelihood that tryptophan will be processed through a kinorinin pathway. And this uh, uh, could, be, uh, could represent the link between uh, the immune system activation and depression. Another potential uh, mechanism is uh, uh, consider two players that are the immune system overactivation and, and uh, altered metabolism, which are uh, uh, 
strictly related to each other, uh, a high percentage of uh, the breast patients show both in immune dysregulation and, and, uh, and metabolic alterations. And uh, uh, there are many mechanisms that may link the two. For instance, the, the um, white adipose tissue uh, can, can produce uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that can unbalance then the uh, immune, immune, uh, the immune system activity and then lead to, to depression. Another uh, potential mechanism uh, is very, it's very complicated one, but uh, uh, I will show uh, the core here of this mechanism that is an imbalance between immune responses between the innate and adaptive immunity, which is accompanied also by a dysregulation in T cells. And these uh, alterations lead to uh, mental, mental illness. A fourth mechanism uh, that may link uh, uh, depression and, 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 and uh, altered immune function is uh, uh, the interplay between plasticity and inflammatory response. And this is uh, uh, my, my research topic, so I will spend the, uh, some more minutes on this. And uh, uh, in particular, we consider plasticity uh, as a recovery from psychopathology because a behavioral plasticity is what allows uh, a patient to switch from a depressive status to mental well-being. And uh, uh, classically, immune activation has been considered detrimental for, for plasticity. However, more recently, it is also been shown that the inflammatory processes are key in plasticity and a very important contribution has been given by Arazzi Mia. And uh, uh, this, uh, these informations allowed us to interpret uh, uh, data that we obtained a um, few years ago. In particular, we had uh, two populations of uh, uh, experimental subjects of mice with uh, uh, low or high baseline levels of inflammatory markers. And we uh, administered uh, uh, SSRI to, to them, Froxin to them, in order to increase uh, uh, neuroplasticity. And what we found is that when SSRI was given to uh, mice with a high baseline uh, inflammatory levels, then we had a reduction in inflammatory levels. By contrast, when uh, the SSRI was given to uh, animals with the basal low levels of, uh, uh, of inflammatory markers, we had the opposite effect. And in order to explain this, and to relate uh, the increased plasticity due to SSRI administration with the change in inflammatory markers, we built a model that uh, is, uh, um, pro uh, provides a potential relationship between plasticity and inflammation and inflammatory markers. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, inflammatory markers and immune system activity should be tightly regulated in physiological range in order to allow for high uh, plasticity levels. And these models allow also to predict uh, what anti-inflammatory uh, uh, challenge could do, because uh, if we provide an anti-inflammatory, if we administer an anti-inflammatory challenge in individuals with uh, high levels of inflammation, then we have a normalization of inflammatory markers. And this allows for higher plasticity and, and, and thus uh, uh, um, increase the likelihood of, of recovery. However, the same challenge given in individuals with a uh, physiological range of inflammatory markers, in this case, uh, the, the, there could be a reduction, an excessive reduction of uh, um, immune activity and therefore a reduction in plasticity that might reduce the likelihood of a recovery. In order to test that this uh, uh, Hypothesis, this interplay, we uh, administered uh, experimental subject, uh, adult male mice with uh, a pro inflammatory challenge, and expected that this uh, provides, uh, uh, um, produces a reduction in plasticity. But we also administered to other, another group of animals an anti inflammatory challenge. And in this case, also, we expected to see a, a reduction in, in, in plasticity. In order to do that, uh, uh, to achieve that, um, we uh, uh, injected the IP uh, uh, ibuprofen, that is an anti-inflammatory challenge in two doses, or LPS, that is the pro-inflammatory challenge in two doses. And we had also a fifth group that was uh, the signing group, the control group. 
And uh, after three hours, we measure markers of neuroplasticity such as long term potentiation and uh, BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophic factor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I won't go into detail for, for uh, the changes induced by ibuprofen and LPS on uh, physiological endpoints and inflammatory markers. Clearly, we found a marked difference between the effects of these two drugs. But what's interesting here is the effects of ibuprofen and LPS on plasticity markers. And this is the LTP. And you can see here that the two low doses of, LTP, of LPS and ibuprofen does not produce any effects compared to the selling group, to the control group. However, what's interesting is that the, both the high doses for LPS and ibuprofen produce a reduction a similar re reduction in LTP. And uh, a similar feature was found for BDNF levels. Also in this case, compared to selling group, the two low doses uh, had uh, uh, showed a reduction, but this was uh, just uh, a trend and not significant, but the two high doses found uh, showed a clear market reduction of BDNF levels compared to controls. And uh, all this uh, picture uh, co corroborates our hypothesis that uh, both an excessive, excessive activation or, or, or reduction uh, in, in activity of the immune system leads to uh, a decrease in, in, in plasticity. And we also have other, other endpoints uh, uh, corroborating this idea. And uh, uh, this, uh, our results are in line with uh, uh, data in the literature, such as those from uh, Charles Raison and Andrew Miller, showing that uh, uh, treatment with the infliximab, an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, depends on the uh, baseline CRP concentration. And it's, uh, uh, this uh, treatment is uh, um, beneficial when uh, uh, the baseline uh, CRP, uh, C-reactive protein concentration levels are high, but uh, uh, when uh, the um, uh, CRP concentration is uh, uh, low, this, this, uh, uh, this treatment can be even uh, unfavorable. And uh, finally, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, um, interpretation about the potential link between uh, the immune dysregulation and uh, major depression provides an explanation for the egg and chicken and neither necessary nor sufficient issues because uh, it predicts that uh, we could have a person that is depressed uh, without any inflammation, and also a person that is uh, perfectly uh, mentally health with a uh, low-grade inflammation. But what's most interesting here is then what these two conditions co-occur. And in this case, uh, they establish a permissive causal relationship because uh, the low-grade inflammation that is associated with the reduced plasticity and ability to recover uh, hampers uh, the reduce the likelihood of the depressed patients to recover and, and therefore the depressive episodes tend to be uh, to be longer and this might explain why in a so high percentage of uh, uh, depressed patients Patients, uh, there are there are uh, uh, high percentage of uh, depressed patients show increased uh, inflammatory markers, uh, chronic low grade inflammation in particular. So it's like uh, uh, inflamed patients are trapped in a depressive state. Finally, the take home message here is that uh, underlying mechanisms making immune dysregulation and security disorders have not elucidated, been elucidated yet. However, there are many models that uh, explain such link. None of them is exhaustive, but are a very heuristic power and also uh, uh, can be, can be uh, potentially translated to the clinics. But the most important uh, point here is that the immunopsychiatry is represent one of the most promising approach to, 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 to understand uh, the neural basis of psychiatric disorders. And, uh, however, I have to admit that I'm a little bit not objective here. Uh, however, I, I think really this is uh, an a promising approach. Finally, uh, I thank uh, my research group and, and the people who collaborated with me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Igor. I think what we should do is go continue with uh, Lucille's talk and then maybe take some time to take some uh, combined questions. Okay. So I, I will stop my, my presentation. Yes. I cannot share my screen, Igor, since, yeah, great.
Okay, I guess you can see my screen now. So thank you very much, Igor. To start, I would like to thank Brenda and Livia, and of course, Mario for, for organizing this symposium. This is very important to us to, to meet, although it is virtual, it's also always very nice and very important to, to meet all together between friends and colleagues and to discuss and brainstorm on these topics that we all affectionate a lot, which is immunopsychiatry. So when we prepared this uh, symposium with, I, with Igor, we decided to focus on, on mechanisms. And I will discuss more particularly all the findings that have been discovered in, in clinical populations. So I will discuss primarily the uh, clinical findings and, and based on inflammation driven depression. And we'll, I will present more, more particularly the clinical evidence for relationship between inflammation and depression the underlying mechanism and the biomarker of this relationship. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm just going to start with a few words on depression. You all know that depression is a, a, it's currently representing the leading cause of morbidity and disability worldwide. It's affecting more than 200 million people. Despite available treatment options, the prevalence of depression is continuing uh, to, to increase, with you can see a more than 80% increase between 2005 and 2015. And this is, of course, associated with substantial management and treatment difficulties, since more than one third of patients, of depressed patients, do not respond to conventional antidepressant. Interestingly, interestingly, you can see from this part of the slide that the, pre, uh, the prevalence of depression is particularly high in conditions that are associated with the activation of immune processes, including inflammatory uh, mechanisms. And you can see, for instance, that the prevalence in autoimmune disorders and certain type of cancer, cardiovascular disease or chronic illnesses, but also in obesity is particularly high. <laughs> which is particularly higher than the prevalence that we can measure in the general population. So all of this leads obviously to the possibility that inflammation contribute to the pathophysiology of depression in these conditions. And supporting this notion, there are a large number of data, and here I just mentioned two uh, recent meta-analyses, but you can find it in the literature really more data supporting this and showing that depression is associated with increased inflammatory processes. You can see that levels of blood cytokines, but also uh, cytokine receptor are significantly increased in depressed patients compared to controls. Importantly, it has also be, been shown that uh, drugs that target uh, inflammation and particularly that block inflammation, including cytokine inhibitors, can also improve uh, the depressive state and the neuropsychiatric status of patients. In this particular study, and I think this is, this is the, first that the, the first study showing this uh, evidence, but you have now many more studies showing similar results, you can see that in patients with psoriasis and treated with etanercept, which is an anti-cytokine, anti-TNF, particularly the, the, the etanercept not only improve the, 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 medical, uh, the medical status of the patient, improve psoriasis, but also improve depressive symptoms in those patients. So in patients with comorbid depression, you can see that etanercept significantly improve uh, the, neuro the neuropsychiatric state of those patients. So this is very important. It was the first evidence showing that when you block inflammation, you can significantly improve in the depression in those patients. So the question arises regarding uh, the mechanisms and the factors that can contribute to this inflammation in depressed patients. So now there are different factors that have been identified, including, of course, the age of the patients, but also medical comorbidities, adiposity, obesity. We know that this is associated with inflammation and also with a greater prevalence of depression. We know also that early life stress, personality disorders, lifestyles, but also unbalanced dietary habits can contribute to this inflammatory, low-grade inflammatory states that we can see in depressed patients. And interestingly, there are no few, uh, not, not few, but more, more and more evidence showing that the same mechanisms that can also contribute to, to treatment resistance in depressed patients. So all of these data support the notion that there is a relationship between inflammation and depression. Nevertheless, they don't uh, provide the evidence that inflammation can causally contribute to the development of depression. So do we have this evidence? to support this notion and to, to try to understand if inflammation can, could participate to, in the pathophysiology of depression, we and others have, have been working on the model of interferon treatment, cytokine therapy. And so 
so I'm going to go fast on this data because this, this has been published and, and shown many times, but basically what we found in this population of, the, of medically ill patients treated with interferon alpha is that the chronic administration of the cytokines is associated with the development of neuropsychiatric symptoms. You can see that patients treated with high doses of interferon alpha develop a large number of neuropsychiatric symptoms, including depressive, anxiety, cognitive, neurovegetative, and somatic symptoms. For instance, depressed mood develop in 60% of patients treated with interferon alpha, fatigue in 80%, and in some patients, the intensity and chronicity of those symptoms is sufficient enough to make the diagnosis of major depression according to the SM criteria. And, and you can see that in this study conducted in patients with malignant melanoma treated with high doses of interferon alpha, for several months, the chronic administration of interferon alpha is associated with the development of depression in 50% of patients. So in those patients, we've been able to show that in fact, the development of depression occurs in two different phases. A first phase concerns the neurogenic symptoms, in particular fatigue, psychomotor slowing, reduced appetite. Those symptoms develop in almost every patient treated with cytokines, and they, they develop at early stages of treatment, and they remain persistent during the whole duration of the therapy. In another uh, group of patients, and particularly approximately 30 to 50% of patients, we can see the development of mood and cognitive symptoms, so uh, the characteristic of, of depression, and those symptoms develop at later stages of treatment, usually during the second to third months of treatment. They develop only in, those, in, in half of, the, of, of those patients, supporting the notion that there are some vulnerability factors for that, and we've been able to identify some of them. Interestingly, we've also shown that the development of mood and cognitive symptoms during treatment with interferon alpha can be prevented by the prophylactic administration of antidepressant and particularly SSRIs, whereas neurovegetative symptoms are not prevented by the develop prevented by the develop uh, by the administration of those antidepressants. So this uh, suggests that are, that those type of symptoms rely on different mechanisms. And since I'm going to focus on depression today, I will discuss now the mechanisms that can contribute to the development of depression during chronic inflammatory conditions. So Igor started to uh, introduce one of those mechanisms, and, and I will focus particular on, uh, particularly on this one, and this is the activation of the kynorinin pathway. It is clear now that inflammation is associated with the activation of this pathway through the induction of the enzyme IDO, or standing for endolamine 2,3-deoxygenase. And when IDO is induced by inflammatory factor, it is going to degrade to be responsible for the degradation of tryptophan, which is the main precursor of serotonin, you know, this neurotransmitter, which uh, contributes highly to the regulation of mood. But when there is inflammation, tryptophan is degraded in the kynorenin and quinolinic acid pathway ways, and this is detrimental to the synthesis of serotonin. So basically, the, uh, the, the degradation of tryptophan in these pathways, in this parallel pathway to serotonin, is going to be also associated with the activation of neurotoxic processes, since quinolinic acid promotes the activation of NMD receptor and the release of glutamate. And this mechanism may highly contribute to the development of depressive symptoms during, uh, during an inflammatory state. And supporting this, we've been able to show the chronic administration of the cytokine is associated with significant decrease in the blood, uh, in the blood level of tryptophan in those patients, together with significant increases in kynorenin levels, and particularly in those patients who develop depression during uh, interferon alpha administration. So this uh, is highly um, consistent with the notion that IDO is activated in those patients who develop a depression uh, during inflammatory state. Interestingly, this mechanism is associated with the intensity of depression, here assessed with a Montgomery and Asper depressive state, and particularly with the mood and cognitive features of depression. Supporting further the idea that HIDEO causally contribute to the development of depression, we've been, uh, we shown uh, in, uh, her group has shown, and particularly the group of Natalie Castano in, in preclinical studies, that the, uh, when we block IDO activation in mice that have been pre-treated with LPS, which is a cytokine inducer, we, we can not only block 
of course, the activation of IDO in the brain, but we also block the development of depressive symptoms in those animals. You, uh, you assess in the four swimming test, and you can see in comparison to mice treated with LPS, when the mice are also treated with 1MT, which is the, uh, the IDO, selective IDO inhibitor, they don't develop depressive symptoms. In contrast, and consistent with what we find at the clinical level, they develop those neurovegetative symptoms that, do, that are not prevented by antidepressant and do not seem to be related to ID activation. Here, for instance, you have the example of locomotor activity that is not blocked by 1MT uh, when after LPS administration. So when we found when we uh, when we got this result, we saw that the problem was uh, finally related to reduction uh, depletion of serotonin synthesis. But in fact, our colleague uh, in Atlanta, especially the group of Andy Miller, has, has shown uh, that finally what we see at the periphery, this decrease in tryptophan, is not. Uh, notable in the central nervous systems and as you can in the system of the patient. Uh, as you can see, in those patients treated with interferon alpha, when we take the cerebrospinal fluid of those patients, we see that tryptophan levels are not decreased in the central nervous system. What we see in the central nervous system of those patients is significant increase, increases in, quinol in quinolinic acid level, supporting further the notion that what is most relevant here in the development of depression is the activation of those neurotoxic processes processes and those process, processes are significantly related to the intensity of depression, exactly the same result that we found with the decreases in tryptophan. So from this, the hypothesis moved from the problem of, of serotonin depletion to uh, an, an activation of neurotoxic processes. And interestingly, uh, if we if we try to identify one biomarker of this of this type of mechanism, recent data obtained by the group of Andy Miller and this is published by Ibrahim Arun, uh, show that a uh, plasma level of of, of uh, the ratio of kynorinine of tryptophan, which is an indicator of ID, an index of IDO activation, is significantly related with the ratio of kynorinine of tryptophan in the cerebrospinal fluid of the patient. So you can see that this marker, this peripheral marker, which is very easy to actually to measure, is, uh, is relates particularly well to uh, signs of neurotoxic, uh, neurotoxicity within the central nervous system, and especially also with level of quinolinic acid in the, in the cerebrospinal fluid of the patients. And interestingly, this mechanism, and particularly this biomarker, this plasma level of, of uh, ratio of kynorinin on tryptophan, so hydro activation, is related not only to the intensity of depression, and particularly to anhedonia, but also to uh, the risk of non uh, antidepressant non-response in those patients. It was also found that uh, this is a post-mortem study in patient, in depressed patient who committed suicide. And you can see that in, from this post-mortem study that we can see that depression is associated with, uh, uh, with indication of uh, microglial cell activation uh, together with uh, in an increased expression in those microglial cells of quinolinic acid. And this is related to depression, but particularly to the intensity of depression and also to suicidal thoughts. And you can see in this study, for Sophia Ra, that levels of quinolinic acid are associated with um, suicidal intents in, in depressed patients. So it seems that this biomarker and this mechanism is, is correlated not only to depression, but more particularly to the intensity of depression and specific clinical features, including anhedonia, uh, suicidal thoughts, and, 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 and intense depression. So I would like now to, for the last part of my talk, to move to a clinical condition that are associated with a chronic low-grade endogenous uh, activation of the immune systems. So here I use a model of interferon alpha treatment to show you that some system and some mechanism can be activated, but do we have any evidence now that those mechanisms also contribute to the development of depression in patients who, who display only a chronic low-grade inflammation and endogenous uh, inflammation? And here we've been using, and we are currently working on this model in our group, the model of obesity. Obesity, you all know, is an inflammatory condition with inflammation. 
originating primarily from the adipose tissue, but also from modification in the gut microbiota. And this peripheral inflammation in obesity is likely to contribute to the development of neuropsychiatric symptoms that uh, Igor mentioned uh, in this talk. Interestingly, we also know that obesity is associated with a high prevalence of depression. I already mentioned that in my talk, but you can see here that this is particularly true in severe cases of obesity. Severe and very severe obesity has associ are associated with high prevalence of depression, both in men and women. And interestingly, we've, we, we conducted a study to try to understand and to confirm that inflammation in obesity was associated with depression. So we did this study in a group of subjects stratified based on their BMI. So we had four groups of subjects, a group of limb control, a group of, of patients with, with mild to moderate obesity, a group of patients with severe obesity, and a group of patients with very severe obesity. There was no difference between the age and gender of those patients, but you can see that obesity and particularly severe obesity was associated with higher level of inflammatory markers, not only uh, high sensitive CRP, but also interleukin-6. And interestingly, you can see that interleukin-6 was also higher in patients with mild to moderate obesity. You also see here that severe and very severe obesity was associated, were associated with higher prevalence of depression together with a higher intensity of depressive symptoms. So to go further on this notion that patients contribute to depression in, in obese subject, we recently conducted a, transcript, a transcriptonic, uh, transcriptomic, sorry, and signaling analysis in an obese subject. And we had two groups of subject, obese subject with depression and obese subject with not, not depressed. And we did not only a transversal ana a transsectional analysis where, where we compared the depressed, obese depressed patient compared to not depressed obese subject, but we also did a longitudinal analysis where we follow up subject after the bariatric surgery at the time when they got, where, where they lost weight, but were also, when also inflammation resolved in those patients. And we did differential gene expression analysis comparing baseline versus post-surgery in depressed patient and comparing depressed versus non-depressed patient. And we identified different uh, networks that seems to be related to depression in those patients, and especially a different upstream regulator, in, including uh, nf uh, uh, related genes, but also uh, genes relating to glucocorticoid receptors. As you can see from this uh, part of the slide, before surgery, at the time where when compared to depressed in orange versus non-depressed obese subject, you can see that depressed subject exhibit higher and higher expression on nf kappa B uh, uh, genes together with higher expression of uh, GR receptor, uh, GR uh, gene expression. And you can see that this is totally resolved after the surgery at the time when the patient are not depressed anymore, when the patient, when the depression got resolved, but also inflammation, you can see that nf kappa B related uh, target genes are significantly decreasing those patients. And this is the same uh, with uh, GR, uh, uh, the GR pathways. So this supports the notion that finally, and if we, if we, if we come back on what Igor mentioned in this talk, the uh, inflammation seems to be ne necessary to contribute to the development of depression, but not sufficient. And there are probably other mechanisms that can contribute, including uh, the, the no notably including the stress response system. And in fact, we now know that there is a strong interaction between these two systems and that uh, stress uh, can contribute to the depressogenic effect of inflammation. We also uh, recently, and this is not published like yet, this is a, 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 an article in preparation, but we found that obese subject exhibited significantly higher level blood level of kynurenine together with a higher kynurenine and tryptophan ratio. So higher IDO activation, despite the fact that their tryptophan level are comparable to a control subject. So there is an IDO activation. And this IDO activation, so, uh, measured by the ratio of kynurenine and tryptophan, is not only associated with the inflammatory profile of the patient, which is here measured by the level of CRP and interleukin 6, but also with the intensity of depressive symptoms in those patients. 
So we went further on this mechanism and tried to understand if neurotoxic processes were uh, involved in this effect. So we, we did a factor analysis and we measure a neurotoxic marker in, in the blood of this patient and we identify a factor uh, explained by not only quinolinic acid, but also three hydroxykinurenine, which are both uh, neurotoxic uh, metabolites. And as you can see from this part of the slide, uh, the hydro activation, the, the ratio of kinerin and tryptophan is significantly associated with the neurotoxic uh, status of the patient with level of quinolinic acid and 3 hydroxykinurenin And this is also associated with the intensity of depressive symptoms in obese subject. So all of this data, this recent data, supports the notion that inflammation and the effect of inflammation on the kinerin pathway with the activation of neurotoxic processes can contribute to the development of comorbid depression in obesity. So from that, what can we conclude and what are the clinical implications for that? So uh, how can we intervene in patients with chronic low-grade inflammation where we are a psychiatrist and we have a patient in our office with inflammation and, uh, and depression? What can we propose to those patients? There are different options that may be uh, think of. Of course, we can promote a different intervention uh, in terms of, of changing lifestyles in obese subject or, or subject with overweight. We can promote weight, we can, uh, uh, promote weight loss and exercise that we know uh, are being associated with the regulation of inflammation and, and uh, changes in the in dietary habits, of course. We can also uh, promote nutritional intervention including uh, intervention using nutrients with immunomodulatory properties, such as omega-3 fatty acid, antioxidant, or a cocktail of amino acid that, um, that can regulate eventually the, uh, uh, the tryptophan pathways and kinerinin pathway. And we can finally uh, uh, propose uh, pharmacological strategies, including strategy uh, uh, with anti-inflammatory agent and, and, uh, and inhibitor of IDO with 1MT, for instance. So for this, I'm going to, to stop here. I, I know that I'm already, uh, I already took a lot of time, but just to finish, I would like to, to present also my group, just to mention that this mechanism can also uh, contribute to uh, antidepressant non response in, in depressed patients and, 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 and different persons that contribute to this uh, different study, both at the clinical and preclinical levels, and are collaborators in the study. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lucille and Igor, uh, for two excellent talks uh, that were really complimentary. Um, Lucille, maybe you can stop sharing um, slides so that we can see some faces. Um, and I know in the chat um, there have been several uh, questions posed. I know some of these questions are coming back in uh, the next uh, talks. For instance, questions about should we treat depression with immunosuppressant substances? I think Lucille already um, tapped into that, but I know that the later talks by um, Bernard Brown and Carmine Parianta will be completely dedicated to that. So I propose we skip that question now. Um, there is also a question um, how we could adjust the immune system to benefit neuroplasticity. Uh, with the question, Gabi asked this question, is it necessary to measure the baseline cytokine levels before start treatment? Igor, is that a question you want to say more about? I think this will come back also. Um, Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question, Brenda. Could you, could you repeat it? Um, Gabi asked, um, how could we adjust the immune system to benefit neuroplasticity? And okay. I think this probably comes back also uh, later, but maybe you can say something about it from your preclinical study point of view. Y yes, uh, um, from, from my mechanistic perspective, uh, uh, what should be done is to um, regulate uh, the immune activation in order to have it in a physiological range. Uh, so uh, avoiding either an excessive activation, but also an excessive reduction uh, and this, uh, uh, this uh, allows for uh, key uh, processes such as plasticity that uh, are fundamental for recovery from uh, uh, psychopathology to uh, mental well-being. So what is important to do is to not to 
uh, it, it just increase or decrease, but regulate. This is uh, what should be done for, for in, in my, my mechanistic perspective. Okay. Um, other questions, more general questions that have been raised. Uh, one uh, by um, Tamur uh, Sariat is uh, that you both, Lucille and uh, Igor, don't mention uh, immunogenetic imprinting. Can you maybe say something about whether you believe there is a role for, for this at all? Would it be me or Lucille? Yeah, it's, a, it's raised to both of you. So who wants okay. to address that question? I, 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 I believe that uh, uh, genes are, are key. Uh, are, however, they, their role should be, should be uh, contextualized. So, uh, uh, according to, to, the, to the immunogenetic imprinting, uh, uh, different strategies should be achieved to, 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 to um, have a, a mental well being. So, th these are important factors, but uh, again, uh, they, their uh, contribution is a relative context, so uh, should be uh, uh, interpreted according to the the living conditions and other biological factors of the patient. This is my, my view. Okay. Another more general question is raised by uh, Codrin. Um, how would immunopsychiatry explain the evolutionary origin of depression? Is there some truth to the idea that the wide prevalence of depression could be associated with some level of a evolutionary advantage. Lucille, you want to say something about this? This is a very interesting question. Um, of, is there some truth to the idea? I, I, I don't know what to say. There are some, is there is some truth. What we can say that, you know, I don't know if there is an evolutionary advantage of being depressed, but uh, what I really believe is that, you know, uh, the, uh, inflammation and, and, and the effect of inflammation on, on behavior and, and when, those if, when, when those alteration and effect of behavior remain, you know, control, controllable and, and, and regulated can be good because we know that, you know, inflammation use all those symptoms that we call sickness behavior for good purpose, you know, to, to, to induce, to, to promote, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the fact that the, the body can uh, f fight in an easy way and, and consistent way to with the virus, for instance, and 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 the, the and and yeah the, the the infection. But what we know is that when this inflammation is dysregulated and when the symptoms become become clinically relevant, well, uh, they are in the in depression. I'm not sure that it is a very good you know evolutionary perspective. I think those symptoms need to be at one point controlled and regulated and and remain uh, what we call sickness behavior. They don't need to you know you know they don't have to impair significantly the life of the patient and and the quality of life of the patient when this is the case. I'm not sure. I think this is really a dysregulation of the system, and and we need to control that. This needs to be controlled. I don't know what, what thing my colleague about that, but this is my, you know, my perspective on that. Thank you. Well, I think it's a very uh, adequate perspective. Um, I know that there are many more questions in uh, the chat. Um, I would propose also um, to keep an uh, eye on the timeline that um, I know some of these questions are coming back in next talks. There are lots of questions on what does this mean for treatment? Um, I, I know that there will be more talks on treatment. So I propose we will um, postpone those questions and see whether uh, they will be addressed in um, the next talk. We also have a general um, discussion at the end after all talks. We have half an hour to come come back to some general questions regarding uh, talks. I would like to thank Igor and Lucille again for two excellent talks. And I also would like to ask them whether they can already have a look at the chat, because I think there were a few questions that were very specific to one of your talks. And maybe you can just respond to those questions. Of course. In the chat, yeah. um, because I think that would would also be really nice and, and an appropriate interaction. And then we take some, some major questions uh, later.
Um, then I would like 